Okay, dear colleagues, um, we are about to start in a few minutes. I wait for the guests to be connected and we will launch immediately after the webinar. I think we are almost reaching 70 people connected. I wait for a few more guests. And now we start. So my name is uh, Morgan Roupré. I'm a professor of urology at Sorbonne University in Paris, France. I am also the chair of the European section of Oncourology of the ESO uh, of the EAU. And um, together with the School of Urology, uh, we organize a series of webinars where oncology is uh, taking a good place uh, because uh, we have ongoing and extremely important clinical activities and clinical research in the field of urooncology and especially in the field of bladder cancer. So tonight we'll go through every new insights in the field of bladder cancer, going through localized disease, metastatic disease. This is why I'm surrounded by prestigious, I would say, colleagues. And um, the first um, of all of them is uh, Dr. Carme Mir. She's from Spain and uh, she's a member of the board of the uh, the open section of oncourology. Uh, we will have Professor Xilinas from Paris, France. is a good friend and colleague and uh, a member of the panel of the non muscle invasive bladder cancer EAU guidelines. And of course, there is no way we can uh, go through this topic without discussing with a medical oncologist. And uh, my uh, good uh, friend, um, Enrique Galande from Madrid, will be there uh, to deal with uh, the new kids on the block in the pipeline of the treatments of metastatic bladder cancer. So let's move forward into the direction of uh, how to improve the steps of the surgery at the moment where uh, we challenge the possibility to take out the bladder in muscle invasive bladder cancer. Uh, I would ask Carme to join me. Carme, are you there? And uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, we'll go through your presentation. I will let you know what is popping up in the Q&A. Thank you, Carme. Thank you, Morgan, for the uh, invitation. I'm happy to participate today. Um, let me share my screen. Um, so today we, we will talk about two topics. One is the, is the enhanced recovery after surgery for radical cystectomy. And the other part of the presentation is about the uh, perioperative treatment for uh, bladder cancer. I have uh, no conflicts uh, for the current presentation. And as it is well known, uh, the, one of the major issues with radical cystectomy has always been the GI complications and was the major drawback as it increased uh, hospital costs and uh, decreased quality of life. So why, that's why the EROS protocols were reason. Also because there was a very small improvement in post-op complications uh, with the MIS technology. Uh, out of the components of the ERAS protocols that were defined in 2013 by the ERAS Society, no update has been so far. And three parts are included, the pre-op, intra-op, and post-op. These are the items that are mostly included in the most of the protocols, and we will discuss some of them with some evidence about it. Uh, as it is well known, in case of the EDAS protocols team is the secret, definitely a multidisciplinary approach uh, with regular audits uh, is the path uh, for success. We cannot do it alone, definitely. If we go through the pre-op items, uh, some of them are very important, like pre-op counseling, uh, optimization of medical conditions, uh, no bowel prep required, uh, pre-op oral carbohydrates loading, and thromboprophylaxis are some of them that are actually important. And uh, no bowel prep was done, was decided based on a couple of uh, prospective analysis that randomized patients for, for bowel prep versus non-bowel prep. And the, it was shown that there was no difference in terms of complications or patient recovery. So that's why the Air Society supports the no non-bowel prep issue. Um, in terms of pre-op carbohydrate load, uh, there was a meta-analysis of 20-by randomized trial trials that actually in, in all the surgeries that did not show any difference. However, super analysis for radical cystectomy, the patient stayed one day shorter, so that's why it's included in these uh, recommendations. In terms of intraoperative items, also several items are included, as some of them avoiding narcotics, uh, having a fluid administration goal directed, avoiding NG tubes, and preventing like ileal um, with uh, gum, for example. 
In terms of ng-tube, again, um, a, a Cochrane review through 37 randomized trials, including several surgeries in open and MIS, uh, randomized patients from early NG removal versus delayed. And obviously they saw if, if it's delayed, there is longer time to flatus, more lung complications and longer lengths of stay. So that's why the recommendation of the Cochrane is to, not to insert it unless it's needed. Uh, one important item is uh, amibapan that it was, uh, this is a, a peripheral acting opioid receptor antagonist. And what it actually proved in a randomized trial <clears throat> um, in amidopan versus placebo in radical cystectomy patients was that patients had, to, had faster bowel recovery than placebo. Uh, however, this drug is not approved in Europe and we can actually not use it. In the US, there have been some assessments about cost effectiveness of this drug in terms of um, how much it costs. Yes, it is 100 US dollars a day, starting the day of surgery and then once daily uh, during stay. And it, they proved that actually in their system, it uh, decreases the, the short term of stay and decreases the pre-admission rates. So it, it, pro it actually provides an increase in cost. <clears throat> In terms of uh, DVT prophylaxis, uh, aerial protocols are uh, quite clear, as it has shown to decrease the rate of uh, DVT and pulmonary embolism <clears throat> if it's administered up to 20 days after surgery. And also it has shown that patients receiving new adjuvant, that is the trend nowadays, and they have increased rates of DVT, so they can really help compared to patients not receiving it. Does the errors improve the quality of life? Uh, so overall, yes. Uh, this is a measure with ERTC quality of life uh, questionnaires in it. It has shown that patients score better emotionally and physically function. They suffer less problems with bone healing, with fever, thrombosis, and other issues. So it, it does provide an advantage. And in terms of pain management, they also showed that this is the main cornerstone of the, our post-ops. And it has shown uh, that a decrease in use of opiates uh, for the, through the ERAS protocols, the patients have actually more pain. If we look at the, at the line on the VAS course, uh, 3.1 versus 1.1 for traditional pathways. And they have, however, they have a shorter recovery to bowel function, 22 versus 7.3. So it actually provides an advantage. If we look through some more recent data, there was a last year, a couple of years ago, sorry, uh, randomized uh, systematic review and the individual patient meta-analysis that took all the protocols that were assessed and actually showed that we put them together, EROS protocols, reduce length of stay and complication rates. So from the EROS protocols, what do you have to remember? Basically, the GI complications are the main cornerstone that they are safe and they're applicable in radical cystectomy. They shorten length of stay. They, fast, they become a faster return to bowel function. Fewer complications uh, with some cost savings. And obviously, multidisciplinary team approach is the key. Now I'm gonna move forward to the next section of the talk that implies the operative therapy trials. Um, I divided the talk in three parts. Uh, new adjuvant trials, adjuvant trials, in bladder spinning trials. And this will give us an idea also what my next colleague will talk about. And if we go through the new adjuvant, new adjuvant is a well-established uh, cisplatin-based combination therapy prior to radical cystectomy based on several trials done in the 2000s, SWOP 87, 10, for example. And the key is that it results, it results in pathologic complete responses and the time of radical cystectomy. And it's important because that is associated with favorable long-term outcomes. Also, it has shown that through genetic analysis that the presence of micrometastatic disease is there at diagnosis. So the rationale for accepting chemotherapy prior to curative intent is there. So I look through all the neoadjuvant trials that we have so far, and we look at the PT0 rates. On the <clears throat> yellow table, we have the trials with uh, chemotherapy, only different strategies have been tested actually to improve outcomes from neoadjuvant. Um, all of them looking at the T0 rates in this case are over 30%. Also, depending on how much percent of clinical T3 patients were included, that's why I put it in the table. And a couple of trials that need to be 
um, record, um, remember is one of them is the Vesper, as you can see, this is the dose dense embag that actually showed uh, better local responses at the price of increased uh, side effects. And as we can see, the, the rates are around 30%. Coxon is the other trial I have to remember. Coxon based basically an algorithm that predicts sensitivity to cancer cells. I was trying to prove which best chemotherapy would be for each patient. However, it didn't show any differences. So on the right, we can see the trials with intensification, what I would call. So they use, for example, GMCs plus IO or IO without any cisplatin, or IO alone. And as we can see, the PD0 rates are a little bit higher, maybe between 30 and 40, depending also on the percentage of T3s. Uh, but these are the outcomes that we have uh, so far. Um, some, some molecules have been used in order to intensify the, these responses that we just talked about. Some of them are the immune enhancers like NKTR, that is basically an enhancer, enhancer of IL-2 pathway. Um, the other one is a uh, lean rodestat that is basically an enhancer through a uh, uh, DOI1 uh, pathway. And the other two is ifortumab velutin or sacitumab govitecan that are antibody drug conjugates. <clears throat> and, uh, one of them looks at NACIN4 that is highly expressed in, uh, in uretilial cells. And the other one, uh, SG at uh, antitrop2. And uh, probably Dr. Grande will talk about it a lot more than what I, I, I will develop. And what happens is that all these enhancers or antibody drug de delivery, they are all included in trials that are ongoing. On the top part, we can see the ones that are cisplatin ineligible. And below, we can see the ones that are cisplatin eligible. So we're really looking forward to see if these intensifiers can help improve the TC T0 rates, and that is actually a surrogate for a favorable outcome. So if we move, if we move to the adjuvant immunotherapy area, a few trials are also ongoing. Two of them have reported outcomes in vivo 010, that was a negative trial, and Checkmate 274, that it was a NIVO versus placebo, that was actually a positive trial. Uh, we are looking forward getting the results of the other trials. Um, also a reminder that uh, we are talking about a very selected population that is a high risk population, either with uh, bad outcomes out of new adjuvant, T2, T4 or positive notes or without new adjuvant. Also the primary endpoint in all these cases, disease free survival. Just a reminder that this year we, uh, we had an update of the um, meta-analysis from adjuvant chemo trials. And uh, in this case, it, it included individual participant data. It was published in uh, European Urology, I think a month ago, and it showed overall <clears throat> advantage uh, survival for first time for patients receiving adjuvant chemotherapy versus none. Let's talk about in vigor 010, that's the tesol tesolizumab in this context versus observation. This was a negative trial. <clears throat> it didn't provide an advantage for patients receiving a tesolizumab in the context of high risk. What is interesting to me is that the, the, the group of patients with, that were actually on observation, they had, as we can see in the arrow, a median DFS, a disease-free survival of 16 months that actually looks uh, pretty good, I would say. And so you would tend to think that maybe this is not the standard population, which actually would be around 12 to 13 months as per CR data. And what we can also get out of uh, Invigor 010 that was a negative trial is that uh, actually ctDNA that was analyzed as a biomarker is a good biomarker for a minimal residual disease. It could help us uh, guide our treatment. As we can see on the graph, uh, the reds are the uh, observation, the blues, the atezolizumab. If patients had positive ctDNA, that would be worst. And actually ctDNA was actually uh, marker of good response to atezolizumab. And what we have to see also is that, uh, unfortunately, this is not perfect, uh, like anything in life. And 30% of the patients uh, that actually had positive C, a negative ctDNA actually had a relapse. So that makes you think about something about the technique. We talked briefly about CheckMec 274, nivolumab versus uh, placebo. That was a positive trial, and some items need to be discussed. 
uh, it looks like there's a group of patients that had neoadjuvant actually um, benefit the most as the HR was pretty good, 0 0.5. And unfortunately, the ones that had um, upper tract disease uh, did not show such an advantage. So probably that's something related to the biology of the disease for upper tract that's more FGFR oriented. Patients had adverse uh, outcomes out of uh, grade three to five in 18% of the cases, and the discontinuation rate was 12%, that is quite standard. And quality of life was maintained overall. Uh, quality of life actually um, was assessed with these uh, quality of life questionnaires, that is a standard for all cancer trials. However, it makes you think about if it's good enough in order to get the assessment of the long-term toxicity of uh, immunotherapy. The third part of this talk is about bladder preservation strategies. And as you know, radiotherapy is part of the, of the game and uh, because it actually enhances some neo neoantigens <clears throat> that uh, can help immunotherapy work better. There are several combinations, radi radiation plus IO, radiation plus chemo plus IO, radiation plus chemo um, having um, DDR mutations or post chemo RT and IO. What do we have so far in terms of bladder preservation strategies? There are three trials that are phase two and with small number of patients, mostly T2. And looking at um, bladder intact disease free survival is an inter intermediate primary endpoint. They are pretty good, around 80% for all of them. And the CR rates, as you can see, uh, the, C, the, the complete responses are a little bit different in terms of definition. So comparing between them is a little complicated somehow, but they are pretty high. We'll have to see the long-term results of that. <clears throat> There's an interesting trial that is ongoing and that last, last year published the uh, interim results at one year. This is a phase two, 77 patients included with one TRBT showing the muscle invasive, three cycles of, advanced, of accelerated and back, and the second QRVT. If the patients were to have no disease, they could enter the pathway of active surveillance. That it was actually in 40% of the population. And 76% of the patients that actually had the T0, they had the DDR mutation. That is for good prognosis. Uh, but however, so far the results have shown that patients in active surveillance, 50% of them actually had some kind of recurrence. So we'll have to see the next year results if anything has changed. <clears throat> in terms of bladder preservation, we are looking forward to trials that would actually define the role of uh, IO in trimodal therapy, one with atezone, the other one with Pembro, and also looking at this concept of bladder inter-disease free survival at uh, one year. So the take home message for today is that multidisciplinarity management is essential in any perioperative care, either for surgery or for uh, chemotherapy. Neoadjuvant chemo IO approaches uh, with intensification, intensification is a work in progress. We still don't know what would be the best approach. Adjuvant has shown to improve actually this pre-survival, maintaining quality of life for this group of patients. And neoadjuvant seems to benefit the most. Um, and bladder preservation strategies are well established, they are equivalent, and uh, again, the best combination is still under development. Bio biomarkers in this case are very needed and it will help a lot in decision making. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. It's a very good, uh, very good presentation. Can you hear me correctly? Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm just checking from the from the guests, and we started the, the presentation with only 60 or 70 guests, and we are more than uh, 120 now. So obviously, uh, your, present, your presentation was very well attended. Just in terms of um, one short question before we move to the next presentation, and we'll keep uh, the remnant question for the end of the uh, for the end of the session. What is in your mind? Um, and it's coming from Evangelos Cleaning um, uh, Us. Um, you have the checkmate uh, 274, uh, which is positive on DFS, um, while MVGOR is negative. Do you think that placebo or surveillance are good control arms, or adjuvant chemotherapy should be the comparator? Yeah, probably that's a very controversial no, because of um, how the results are. But as I, as I said, 
it looks like the pool of patients that were included were actually quite different because if you look at the checkmate 274, the the control arm was the placebo arm, sorry, in this case, uh, was 10 months instead of 16. So it's probably a different population. That's why you are seeing the difference there. What which would be the best comparator would be hard to to establish, probably. Okay. I agree with you and thank you for uh, from everyone also for raising the point and uh, without transition I will ask him to step in. Um, thank you Carme. We'll uh, see you at the end of the session. Evangelos, can you hear me correctly? Yes. Uh, yes, good. Can, can you yeah. show us your face? Perfect. Hey. Good uh, to have you on board, Evangelos. Uh, we are very proud to uh, have you as a lecturer tonight about urine biomarker. Not an easy topic because we sit at many, many events, but maybe there are some pragmatic messages that can be sent to the clinicians. We are listening to you. Sure. Thanks a lot, Morgan. Thanks a lot for the uh, kind invitation to talk about uh, urine biomarkers, which is uh, quite a hot topic the last two years. Not as hot as uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, but still. So um, these are my conflicts of interest. Um, I would like to talk about uh, the unmet need, especially in the uh, surveillance uh, regimen of uh, NMIBC, uh, and then talk about the old uh, urinary and commercially available markers, and then talk about three uh, promising and innovative uh, markers that have shown uh, interesting results and uh, are still awaiting uh, clinical pertinence in terms of uh, bladder cancer and uh, in order to come to the uh, market uh, in Europe. So the unmet need can be uh, split in uh, the economical burden and also the patient burden uh, based on the uh, current surveillance protocols. So as you may know, uh, bladder cancer is the uh, most expensive uh, cancer to uh, manage and this has been very nicely shown in the across European Union a study by Lea Letal in European Urology six years ago. Uh, and this is mainly due to uh, our follow-up regimens based on cystoscopy and urinary cytology, which is the standard of care, um, of course, recommended from American and also European EU uh, guidelines for all type of um, NMIDC, low risk, intermediate and high risk. Of course, this cost depends on the frequency of the uh, uh, performance of the examinations. And of course, a low risk patient, as you can see here in uh, an American study, cost approximately during the course of a follow up $52,000 in terms of direct costs. While, of course, a high risk patient, due to the uh, frequency of cystoscopies, which is higher, and of urine cytologies, uh, cost more than $3,000. Uh, $300,000 over the course of a five years follow-up. So you can see that these costs are really important. Moreover, we are facing also uh, sometimes an overuse uh, of our uh, tools of follow-up, especially uh, unneeded uh, cystoscopies have been evaluated in an American study from the uh, Veteran Affairs, uh, looking at low-risk NMIBC, as you know, uh, these patients should undergo cystoscopy at three months, then at 12 months, and then every year up to five years. And you can see from this study that there was an overuse of cystoscopies in 75% of patients, uh, meaning that this um, costs a lot to the society, to the patients, and it's also a burden in terms of organization for our uh, practices. If we look at the uh, patient burden, uh, from a physician's perspective, we can say that cystoscopy is a non-invasive and quite easy to perform a procedure. And what about the patients? We can assume that there is a substantial discomfort and sometimes anxiety. And I would say that anxiety is more uh, based on the result, potential result of the cystoscopy examination than from the exam. But we all know some patients that do experience anxiety due to the examination. And there were two studies, uh, two surveys evaluating uh, the uh, patient's burden uh, in terms of cystoscopy uh, use uh, during NMIBC uh, surveillance. But you can see here that uh, patients, uh, they are okay with performing cystoscopy if it is the best tool to uh, perform the surveillance of their disease. Uh, 
However, if they had a urine test, non-invasive urine test, but could replace cystoscopy with good results in terms of sensitivity, 90-95%, then they would be okay to switch from cystoscopy to a urine test. So what are these urine tests? Of course, you know the urinary cytology we all use in this practice, non-invasive method. Uh, we are inspecting uh, exfoliated urethelial cells for morphological uh, features of malignancy. And of course, uh, the interpretation relies on the experience of the pathologist and the dedication to uropathology, to your pathologist. And uh, there was a difficulty in standardization that has improved due to the uh, Paris classification that came uh, to uh, our practices six years ago. Uh, of course, uh, cytology, uh, the specificity of cytology is very high. Uh, sensitivity is limited, and especially in low-grade tumors, because the morphology is quite the same with normal urethelial cells, um, and that's why the sensitivity is limited from urine cytology. The other old-fashioned urinary uh, commercially available markers, uh, I selected these two protein uh, based uh, urine markers, and MP22 and DTA, which were very famous, I would say, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, both are um, trying to find proteins in the urine sediments. And you can see that surveillance and, and sensitivity and specificity are quite average, basically around 70% for sensitivity and 8, 90% for specificity. And so the performance was a uh, question of these protein tests. We have also um, fish test and also immunofluorescence assays that has been, have been developed, I would say 15 years ago. Uh, these are not used right now because the balance between the efficacy of these tests and the cost that is associated with their use uh, is not in favor of the prescription of these tools. And you can see that Eurovision was quite a performance, I would say, a test with good sensitivity and very good specificity in the uh, surveillance uh, regimens. So what are the new uh, kids on the block, as Morgan could say? Uh, ADX bladder, which uh, an ELISA test, uh, detecting uh, mini chromosome maintenance protein, number five. Uh, they are highly expressed uh, in um, malignant cells and they are low or absent in healthy uh, urophilia cells. So they are quite interesting. You can see here the uh, uh, sensitivity and specificity results from the uh, uh, free prospective uh, studies. Uh, we'll focus on the study from Morgan Roupre, published two years ago in the Journal of Urology, uh, looking at 1400 NMIBC patients in a prospective manner. And the uh, sensitivity uh, was 45% of the test. But what was interesting was the negative predictive value, which was 93% in all comers, and especially uh, the ability to rule out the presence of non-PTA low grade, so basically intermediate or high grade disease, um, was 99%, so very interesting results in terms of efficacy. Uh, a second publication from this cohort compared the uh, ability of ADX bladder compared to uh, urine cytology uh, to predict uh, disease recurrence in the uh, surveillance setting. And you can see in the right part of the slide that the sensitivity was higher compared to urine cytology for the overall population, for low grade, especially high grade. And of course, when you uh, again excluded PTA low grade recurrences, you can see that the sensitivity of this test against rather was much higher than urine cytology. So here we have something very interesting because our aim in practice is to rule out uh, high-grade disease. The second uh, kid that's interesting and uh, has been uh, evaluated in recent uh, couple of years, it's the uh, bladder epicheck, which is an RT-PCR urinary test uh, based on DNA methylation evaluation of 15 genes. It gives you a score, and basically the cutoff of 60 determines a positive epi score. So there are several studies. Uh, showing, uh, again, nice sensitivity, but moreover, very interesting uh, negative predictive value, especially uh, for uh, non-low grades, again, which I think is the most relevant 
uh, end point here in the uh, surveillance setting. So another uh, test that is interesting in terms of uh, results of sensitivity and negative predictive value. The third one is expert bladder cancer monitor, which targets uh, mRNA, uh, five of them. And uh, it's an assay uh, that basically uh, evaluates this mRNA and gives you a positive versus negative uh, test. And you can see that, again, sensitivity was overall 74%, high grade, much higher, 83%, negative predictive value, again, 98% for uh, high grade, uh, for exclusion of high grade tumors. So all three of them have good sensitivity and even better for high grade disease, and especially a very good negative predictive value in order to rule out high grade disease. The uh, important question here is what do we do with these results and how we do translate these results in daily practice? And are we able to uh, change our standard of care, which is combination of urine cytology and uh, cystoscopy? And that's the uh, ongoing question. So in conclusion, I would say that these tools uh, cannot be used right now in primary diagnosis. They have been only really evaluated in the uh, surveillance setting, which is definitely a high medical need, especially in terms of organization and economical burden. I think that as of today, they are not able to uh, replace cystoscopy or fully replace cystoscopy. And I think that uh, the three I show you are the most promising. And one option that we can debate on that could be to uh, alternate cystoscopy in these modern or innovative in markers, and that could be the winner for implementation in daily practice. Thank you. Thank you, Evangelos, for this uh, extremely nice overview. I think there are two issues, as you mentioned. Uh, one is that uh, we have obviously good technology and uh, it appears to be ready for prime time, but we don't know which marker to choose. Uh, you may already uh, I would say a subjective selection, which appears to be appealing. But uh, at the end of the day, we have no head-to-head -head comparison between the markers. Yeah. This is the first point. And the other point that you know particularly well because you're involved in the process in France is the reimbursement. Because at the end of the day, we work in Europe. We're uh, in, I would say, socialized healthcare system where everything is reimbursed, more or less. And... I think the philosophy is different in the United States. How do you see a way for this marker to go through uh, the reimbursement process uh, as an easy step to move forward? Because the authorities, they rely on endpoints such as overall survival and so on. It's very difficult for the marker to, uh, to uh, express their, um, the, the, the improvement of the management in the, in the, in the disease. Uh, so let me know your thoughts about that. Yeah, I think Morgan, you raised the, the, the good questions. I think that all of them here, uh, the ones I showed, they have CE tag. So practically you can use them in Europe. However, the real question is who is paying for it? And in Europe, usually uh, patients do not pay. It's part of the insurances or the national system for France and other countries. So is how do we evaluate the uh, expected medical benefit of these urine markers. Uh, that's, the, that's the key question. And I think right now, of course, there's no head-to-head -head comparison to say this one is better than this one. All of them have nice results in terms of uh, test results, but they have not shown that they change the uh, organizational or the standard of care pathway of surveillance of our patients. So I think the next step is to evaluate in prospective trials whether they can change the standard of care of urine cytology and cystoscopy. And I think that it's very complicated in terms of economical evaluation to compare only to, uh, to replace fully cystoscopy, for example. And that's why I think alternate these markers in order to decrease uh, the number of cystoscopies could be a good uh, combination of treatment and evaluation. And that could grant market access uh, to these new uh, urinary markers. Okay, extremely clear, crystal clear. Uh, we get the message. We'll move on to Enrique and uh, we keep you in the loop for the questions at the end of the session. Uh, so Enrique, are you online? 
Yes, I'm here. Good. Uh, Enrique is uh, so involved so in so many sessions with urologists that he became a urologist, to be uh, extremely honest. But he's still an excellent medical oncologist. Um, we went through uh, different, uh, I would say, topics. Uh, localized disease where it's time for cystectomy, non muscle invasive bladder cancer. But uh, where uh, there is, the, I would say, the most... Uh, active research uh, and, and, and new drugs on the market and, and maybe new drugs in the pipeline is probably the metastatic disease. Uh, it was more or less an orphan disease we had to deal with for the last 40 years. And uh, things are changing now. And Enrique is here to let us know what we can expect for the, for the future. So Enrique, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and we are listening to you. Thank you so much for Morgan for this kind invitation. I, I'm delighted to be here with all of you. Well, uh, my task today is to talk about the, the new options, the new alternatives that we have to treat our patients with metastatic urothelial carcinoma. And this is a field that is uh, dramatically changing or has dramatically changed in the last, uh, I'd say, couple of years. We have very good options, very good new options. These are my disclosures. And this is the current picture that we have. Uh, well, since the 80s, we used to treat our patients with cisplatin or carboplatin-based chemotherapy. And uh, since, well, 2005, 2006, something like that, we had taxanes and we had been fluent to treat our patients when our patients were failing to a uh, platinum-based strategies. Uh, from then, there was a desert. And now take a look at how many different subsequent lines of treatment we are supposed to to have the opportunity to offer to our patients. And I say we are supposed because it is depending from country to country to the reimbursement and access to these new medications and not only the medications, to these new uh, molecularly selected patients that we have in the clinic. So uh, do you think that these new lines of treatment are translated into a longer and better overall survival? Definitely, yes. Take a look at these two Kaplan-Meier curves for overall survival coming from 1992, in which I am showing the first randomized phase three trial comparing cisplatin as a single agent, metastatic urothelial carcinoma, versus the first a combination based on cisplatin that we have, the classical MBAC regimen. And that was the key um, uh, the key trial to demonstrate that combinations based on cisplatin were better than cisplatin as a single agent, as you can see here. For the first time, we uh, started to talk about a median overall survival of around one year, which was a great success at that time. Take a look at the current uh, Kaplan-Meier curve for the javelin bladder trial. So it means a chemotherapy as an induction based on cisplatin, followed by maintenance abelumab. This is the overall survival we have here. The shapes of the, of the corpse are different, but take a look at these two things that I think it is important. At the, if we have a threshold of two years, take a look at the percentage of patients that are still alive. Only 20% with only cisplatin-based chemotherapy versus almost half of the patients alive after two years of treatment with the systemic strategy. This is just based on the javelin bladder. This is just based on cisplatin, carboplatin, followed by abeluma maintainers. Not at all. This is just a sum up of the addition of the benefits of subsequent lines of treatment to our patients. But for me, and this is a personal opinion, this is even more important, this part, the last part of the curve, the percentage of patients that are still alive after at least three or four years of treatment or of the diagnosis of the metastasis of these patients. So we are just starting to talk about long-term survivors in patients with metastatic urothelial carcinoma. This is something that we didn't even think about just a couple or three years ago. So this is why we need and we want more subsequent lines of treatment to offer to our patients, because we are just impacting in the long-term overall survival of our patients. Okay. We have this strategy, the subsequent lines of treatment that we can offer, but what can we do in the clinic? Uh, all of our patients are really demanding for these new um, systemic lines of treatment. And we have different subsequent lines of treatment depending on what we are offering as the first line setting. So patients that are progressing to chemotherapy in first line, patients progressing during the induction chemotherapy, no matter if you are using CISGEM 
CarboGem, MBAC, those things MBAC in the first line setting. What are the options that we have? Well, according to the ESMO guidelines, the most or highly recommended options is immunotherapy. Well, here are the results of the Keynote 045 trial, pembrolizumab, a PD-1 inhibitor versus chemotherapy, no matter if you were using docetaxel, paclitaxel, or binflunin. Take a look at the, well, difference in terms of overall survival. Hazard ratio 0.7, which is good, it's okay. However, I would focus on the last part of the curve, on this 20, 15% of patients that are long lasting survivors. And you can say, and you can ask me, hey, but in the uh, chemotherapy arm, in the control arm, there are also patients that are still alive after five, four, uh, six years of follow up. And, and this is true, but this was not seen before the immunotherapy era. Probably most of these patients, long lasting survivors with chemotherapy, are probably because they cross over a progression to receive immunotherapy. This is the major change that we have. Immunotherapy, we still don't know who they will be the one that are really benefiting in a long term, but immunotherapy is really impacting in the overall survival, in the long-term overall survival of a small but significant, clinically significant proportion of patients. There are also another immunotherapy that was approved in the second line setting, a tesolizumab, a PDL1 inhibitor, which are very similar data. Instead of 0 0.7, 0 0.82, as you can see here, has a ratio for overall survival improvement in the intention to treat population. But unfortunately, this trial, the Invigor 211 trial, was considered negative for the primary endpoint, which is the one that you can see here the overall survival in patients with overexpression of PDL1 unfortunately failed to demonstrate any significant differences in terms of overall survival for this particular subgroup. And this is why it is considered that pembrolizumab has more robustness, more level of evidence than atezolizumab in this field. Okay, we are now considering that chemotherapy based on cisplatin followed by abeloma maintenance is the current first line approach that we should do, we should offer to our patients with metastatic urothelial carcinoma. What are the new lines of treatment? What are the new options that our patients have in the clinic? Well, we have two drugs, two novel drugs that are approved and they have the highest level of evidence. Enfortumab bedotin is the first one. But before starting with the new drugs, take a look at the options to re-challenge with platinum-based chemotherapy to our patients after progressions to abelumab maintainers. Progression-free survival with abelumab as maintenance therapy is very short, only four, five months, maybe six months in some of them. However, there are some patients that are progressing after one year or even longer time on treatment with abelumab. Does it make sense to reuse, to offer once again platinum-based chemotherapy? Well, take a look at this retrospective series in which it is seen that probably, probably there are some patients, particularly those patients with a long-term benefit with abelumab as a maintenance therapy, the tumor without progressing because of this maintenance with abelumab, in which we may think twice if they can receive once again platinum-based chemotherapy, particularly for those patients who respond well during the induction phase of the abelumab maintenance strategy. Antibody drug conjugates. For all of you that may be not well related with this kind of new technology that we have, antibody drug conjugates are very easy to understand. They are monoclonal antibodies with two hands. In one hand, they are binding to the tumor. And in the other hand, they are binding or they are bringing on the hand, they are bringing a chemotherapy. So the antibody is binding to the tumor and putting together the chemotherapy, introducing the chemotherapy inside the tumor cell. We have two drugs approved by FDA, only one by the European Medicine Agency, Enfortumab bedotin, which is binding to Nectin-4, which is almost expressed in every uh, tumor with uh, urothelial carcinoma features. Sacitusumab covitecan is binding to TROP2. TROP2 is more selected in this case. Well, uh, we can say that Enfortumab bedotin is linked to uh, chemotherapy, which is a kind of taxane, while Sacitusumab covitecan is linked to a chemotherapy, which is a kind of irinotecan. So two types of different binding points to the tumor, two types of different chemotherapy to be delivered 
on the tumor. The most advanced ones is enfortumapedotin. So enfortumapedotin is binding the tumor because this is binding to nectin-4. It is internalized and degraded inside the tumor cells. And inside the tumor cells, this is releasing the taxin inducing the tumor cell. This is the design of the EV301 trial, the phase three trial that gave the approval to enfortumapedotin in patients with metastatic urothelial carcinoma who have already progressed to platinum-based chemotherapy and immunotherapy, most of them. As you can see here, enfortumapedotin was compared with a standard chemotherapy, docetaxel, paclitaxel, or binflunin, and the primary uh, endpoint of this trial was overall survival. In terms of response, and this is very good, because enfortumapedotin is inducing a uh, confirmed resist radiological response in 40% of the patients in the third line setting. So uh, clinically, enfortumapedotin is rescuing, is making that people that were resistant to platinum-based chemotherapy and immunotherapy are rescued by this kind of agents. Take a look at the magnitude in the benefit of response rate and the magnitude of benefit in progression-free survival. And in addition to that, and the main reason because enfortumapedotin was approved here, was the clear impact clinical and statistically significant in overall survival. Median overall survival for chemotherapy around nine months versus almost 13 months with enfortumapedotin has a ratio 0.7 statistically significant. However, we have a concern here, and the concern is the toxicity. Skin rash, hyperglycemia, um, uh, uh, peripheral neuropathy are the major three toxicities that we should consider before offering enfortumapedotin to our patients. The second antibody drug conjugate, already approved by FDA, not yet by IMA, is the, is the Sasituzumab Goviteca. And in the Trophy 01 trial, you can see that the response rate is around 27%, which seems to be a little bit lower than enfortumapedotin. Of course, we cannot do direct, fair to, uh, this is not fair to do direct head-to-head uh, -head comparison in between different trials, but 27% of responses. The good thing is that maybe, maybe we may have a biomarker, at least a negative biomarker. Those patients, depending on the expression of TROP2, so particularly those patients without such a good expression of TROP2 in the tumor microenvironment, maybe are not benefiting in the same way than other tumors from Sasituzumab Goviteca. Don't forget that TROP2 is the um, is the where the monoclonal antibody is binding to the to the tumor microenvironment. So maybe the expression of TROP2 could be conditioning for the activity of, of Sasituzumab Goviteca. This is the design of the Tropics 04 trial, which is still recruiting patients comparing Sasituzumab Goviteca versus chemotherapy. Once again, docetaxel, paclitaxel or a binflunin in patients who have already progressed to platinum-based chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and they can also have received enfortumapedotin, the other antibody drug conjugates. So probably the design of the Tropics 4 trial will position Sasituzumab Goviteca as a fourth line of treatment of patients with metastatic urothelial carcinoma. Think twice about that. Uh, just two years ago, we have only two lines of treatment. Today, we have at least five different lines of treatment to offer to our patients. The last, um, uh, the last drug that I want to, to talk about is the novel FGFR, the fibrous growth factor receptor inhibitor erdafitinib. And this is the personalized medicine, tailoring medicine adjusted to the field of metastatic urothelial carcinoma. We think that are in between 8 to 30% of patients with metastatic urothelial carcinoma are harboring molecular alterations according affecting to the FGFR3 gene which can be mutations and also fusions of this gene. We have different FGFR inhibitors under development. The only one approved by the FDA, not yet by the European Medicine Agency, is the last one you can see on your right, erdafitinib, which was approved based on a phase two trial single arm, so not a randomized trial, in which erdafitinib was offering for a 40% of response rate with a median progression free survival of 5.5 months. Well, uh, optimistic guys like, like uh, Morgan Rupruet, well may think that this is a good option for patients. Pessimistic guys 
uh, like myself, well, uh, I want a little bit more from a precision medicine. If you are doing the effort to convince your patients to pay out of pocket for a NGS testing, to, to select molecularly your patients, I would be more willing to, well, to find some driver, two more driver of the disease. And unfortunately, despite these 40% of responses, median duration of response is uh, shorter than six months. So, well, I, I think we should demand for more things about it. Um, what are we doing in patients with FGFR3 positive tumors? Are we offering for a antibody drug conjugate like in Fortumab bedotin, or are we offering for a dafitinib? Well, um, retrospective data are showing that the activity of uh, in Fortumab bedotin is exactly the same regardless the uh, presence of mutations in FGFR3. If you have a patient like this with pleural effusion, liver metastasis, and a heavy bulky disease in the primary tumor progressing to platinum and immunotherapy, I, I think what you want in these patients is to have a rapid um, and good response rate. And both strategies, uh, Enfortumab bedotin and erdafitinib, have offering for 40% of responses in less than two months. So let's see in the future if one strategy is better than the other. Take a look at the magnitude of the benefit, uh, depending on the presence or not of FGFR3 mutations that you have with Erda, uh, with Enfortumab bedotin here. And finally, and this is an issue that we have, um, more and more patients are treated in daily practice with single agent immune oncology approach in the first line setting. Remember the most robustness behind the use of platinum-based chemotherapy followed by abeloma maintenance is recommended by level 1A. But uh, in daily practice, at least in the US, well, you can see here that only one third one third of the patients in the US are treated in the first line setting with platinum-based chemotherapy as an upfront approach. And around 28% of the patients are receiving single agent immune oncology drugs. So more and more patients are treated in first line with single agent immune oncology approaches, probably because of industry pressure could be an option, probably because of more patients, more and more patients are meeting the called Gupta criteria. Gupta criteria are these criteria that you can see listed here, and they are helping us to identify in daily practice which are the patients not good candidates and fit to receive any platinum-based chemotherapy, even carboplatin. They are not eligible even for carboplatin. So more and more of my colleagues are treating patients with single agent immune oncology drugs based on this criteria. And we have a phase two trial with Enfortumab bedotin demonstrated that Enfortumab bedotin can offer for 55% of responses plus 31% of complete responses in patients as a second line, in patients who only receive in the first line single agent IO. So probably Enfortumab bedotin could be a good choice could be a good option to offer for patients progressing to Pembro or a TESO single agent in the first line. This is my last slide, and this is just the current peak that we have. When we were using platinum-based chemotherapy, median overall survival was 12 months, one year. When we were offering platinum-based chemotherapy followed by docetaxel, paclitaxel, or binflurin, median overall survival increased up to one year and a half, maybe. Now, with the current options that we have, now with the use of immunotherapy with antibody drug conjugates, uh, FGFR inhibitors, probably this survival is longer than 24 months as a median. But don't forget this last part of the curve, this tail of the curve, in which we are starting to talk about long term survivors in metastatic erythelial carcinoma. Thank you so much to all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Enrique. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm trying to uh, show my camera, but uh, I have no control over it. Anyway, um, we don't care about my face. So uh, the question is, um, you mentioned that we are entering a new era in the field of bad cancer, especially with molecular medicine. And I would agree with you that uh, that appears to be important. Um, there are a few patients that are metastatic from the beginning, and some of them are evolving from the early stages of the disease to the metastatic phase. Uh, there is a high tumor burden uh, in that uh, mutational burden in that tumor. Um, 
Do you believe that when it comes to identification of uh, behavior and uh, existence of VFGFR mutation, we can rely on the transuretral uh, bladder samples that were uh, removed endoscopically uh, a few months or years ago before we treat the metastatic disease? Or would you advocate to go to the biopsy of the uh, new, I would say, lesions? Uh, what is your philosophy around that? That's a wonderful question, Morgan. Uh, as far as the, the bladder cancer, the urothelial carcinoma is a very heterogeneous tumor, probably nothing to do with the primary tumor in terms of the molecular testing that we have or the molecular alterations that we have in the primary tumor are really evolving in time uh, and nothing to do with the uh, metastasis that we have. In the primary tumor, probably we have up to 30 or even higher a percentage of patients with molecular alterations affecting to FGFR. However, in the metastasis, uh, when, do do, uh, when we do the NGS testing of the metastasis, unfortunately, less than 11%, less than 11, from 30 to less than 11% of the patients are harboring these molecular alterations. That means that the tumor is evolving, and that means that we need to think twice. We need to try to re-biopsy all our patients if feasible in the clinic. Okay, perfect. I think um, my camera is not under my control, but I would be happy to share my uh, uh, face and ask also, ah, okay, no, I can. Uh, ask also Evangelos and Calme uh, to come back for this last uh, few minutes that we have to uh, uh, share together. Uh, we have re reunited more than uh, 120 uh, people tonight. So I think it's quite uh, good numbers. Um, Evangelos, Carme, uh, or Enrique, any question on the on the parts uh, that were has been presented by uh, Enrique? Because we have the opportunity, we as urologists, to exchange with him tonight. I think there was a yeah, question. From I you. have a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Evangelos, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Enrique, uh, you you showed us um, very nicely ADC conjugates uh, that have nice uh, efficacy results but they come with a certain degree of toxicity. And do you see that as an uh, issue uh, to their uh, development and arrival in an earlier stage of the disease, meaning first time metastatic, adjuvant or perioperative setting? Absolutely. Uh, probably the most promising combination in this field is the combination of antibody drug conjugates and immunotherapy. The mm -hmm. data from the activity in metastatic setting is exciting. 73% of responders, including more than 20% of complete responders in the metastatic setting. This is amazing, wonderful. However, when this combination in fortumab plus pembrolizumab was used in the neoadjuvant setting, in the neoadjuvant setting, there was a cohort of only 22 patients and in the neoadjuvant mm -hmm. setting, so patients that are potentially curable there, uh, there were three deaths in these 22 patients treated. Yeah. So we need to have a big concern about the use of these novel combinations in, in the early stages. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Carme, any reaction on your side when you um, see all these drugs in the pipeline? Uh, there was a question about the IROC trial that was raised by Evangelos. You want to talk about that maybe? Mm. It just came yeah. out a, a yeah, couple my, of years ago, right? My, uh, my question was, uh, IROC was presented at AUA a few, few days ago and, and uh, published in JAMA. And my question is, do we have now uh, with this latest trial enough evidence to, to say that uh, in terms of guidelines, in terms of daily practice, uh, the evidence is there to support uh, radical cystectomy, robotic assisted uh, radical cystectomy with intracorporeal diversion. That was my question, and uh, because that could impact the uh, outcomes out, um, outside of ERAS. Right. Uh, just the uh, unfortunately, I think the results were not uh, so they are they are statistically significant in terms of uh, their data analysis, but is that clinically meaningful because it's only two days difference in terms of. Uh, return readmission within 90 days so that questions know actually if this is something that may change and also there is no um, cost analysis for so far what is presented so that also raises the concern so I, I don't think so far we change uh, the paradigm for the eras and what I mentioned. Okay we have one question from the Q&A are there any trials for bladder sparing approach that omit radiotherapy 
by that I think that uh, he wants to mean a complete macroscopically endoscopic surgery uh, with only subsequent systemic treatment without going through the, the, the radiation step. Are you aware of that? Mm, I, I, not, I'm, aware not, of, I'm aware of ongoing discussion around the possibility right. to do yeah. that. Yeah. But uh, I'm not aware of any trial recruiting into that direction. There was one in France, actually, led by Motte, if I remember correctly, Evangelos. Uh, led yeah. by... There was one phase two trial, and there is one ongoing. Uh, the name is Sunrise 2, but it's uh, randomizing yeah. chemo radiation uh, versus blood sparing, modern blood sparing approach with uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor targeting PD-1 plus TAR-200, which is a medical device uh, diffusing uh, gemcitabine intravesically uh, mm -hmm. over three weeks. But there is no uh, clinical trial running uh, where you are sure to have a blood sparing approach without radiation therapy. You are randomized in that one. Perfect. Um... Every good uh, thing comes to an end. And I think that uh, we uh, kept the timeline. It's extremely important. Um, I want to think, and you will agree, on behalf of the faculty, the, the, the team of the AU, and uh, especially Timothy, uh, who has in, Timothy Engels, who was in line with us to uh, organize everything. He has set a perfect, uh, I would say, webinar. Uh, in line of the quality of what they do at the School of Urology, so uh, of the AU. So we are happy to, um, to uh, work with him. I would like to thank you. And once again, Carme first, because she's a lady and very talented for uh, our participation tonight. Uh, Enrique um, and Evangelos, thank you very much for being okay. there. Uh, if you still want to exchange with these guys, do not hesitate to reach them on Twitter. Do not hesitate to reach them by email. Um, and uh, we will be happy to see you in Amsterdam in July physically if you can join or uh, in uh, some other virtual events at the ASCO in June if you go there. Uh, be safe and have a nice evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Bye-bye.